Hello, lords and ladies of the realm. It is I, Emily Sophia, aka M. Mighty Sophia, here to break down for you all the latest episode of Game of Thrones. We are currently on the episode that is entitled Blood of My Blood, and I cannot recall if it is episode 5 or 6 because basic numbers are currently escaping me. But that is the episode we are on, and spoiler alert, as I shall be endeavoring to bear all in this review. And I apologize in advance as I shall be doing my best to cover each and every detail, but full disclosure, I am recovering from a mild panic attack earlier. And so yeah, panic attacks are kind of like high fives from Satan and uh, I'm still not feeling great. But Game of Thrones continues to be great, even with a slightly slower episode this week. As I imagine, you know, I, I can already hear the resounding, oh, it was a slower episode, but I think it was pretty dang good. You know, they, they certainly are attending to important business, regardless of whether or not we are hanging out with some of our power players in the game. Um, we got to spend this week with... Arya Stark, a girl who indeed has a name. Uh, we got to spend some time at the marriage of church and state involving King Tommen Baratheon and his beloved bride Marjorie as they commit themselves to serving the gods alongside the High Sparrow and Faith Militant. And it's just a convergence of all of the best things in the world. Um, we also got to spend a wee little bit of time with Daenerys and Drogon, who is always a welcome and fiery presence in the show. And we even got to spend some time at the not so cozy House Tarly, where Samwell was just about to leave his beautiful bride and wonderful little child. And then decided, you know what, screw them all. <laughs> hello, daddy. Hello, mom. I'm your cherry bomb. That is Sam Darley. So let's actually start from there. Um, it has been, it's been such a pleasure to see this relationship blossom between Sam and, and Gilly. And to see the ways in which the two of them have improved one another's lives and made each other stronger and more robust and resilient human beings and we we got to see that on display even even in this episode where sam is is shivering at at the dinner table trying to stifle back tears as uh, as lord tarley his his father just lays it on him thick <laughs> And by laying it on him, I mean he he takes the freaking bread away, which is not okay <laughs> whatsoever. But through amid all of these these accusations and all of um, uh, just ev everything that is being poured out upon him, the wrath of his disappointed father, um, we get to see. Gilly stand up for him and to attest to the fact that he is actually a mighty warrior, one who plunged a blade into the heart of a white walker. And that's not something that anybody in his family is immediately inclined to believe. Um, but all that to say, push comes to shove, and while Gilly is very warmly received by the family initially, as it is revealed that she is actually a wildling, she goes from being a she to an it and is instantaneously dehumanized, but she is willing to to go the extra mile and to put herself on the chopping block for Sam's sake. And he does her one better by refusing to let her be a scullery maid or, you know, being put to work in, in the kitchen while the the bastard is is raised at the household. He realizes that, you know what? They're a team. They are a core unit. They belong together. And what all of these crazy forces in the world have brought together, let no man, a terrible father, no less, separate that situation. So, 
The two of them escape in the night, but not before picking up a family heirloom of sorts. Um, that being Heartsbane, composed of Valerian steel, a very rare find in this world. And it is one that Sam officially has no problem with absconding with, and I am very proud of him for that. <laughs> he has had it up to here and a half. Nobody cares to know the, the things that he that he truly did and saw at Castle Black. And and he knows that that his family has very little respect for him, especially his his father, and the law kind of precipitates down from him, being that this is a patriarchal situation. And so Sam's like, you know what? I'm gonna do my thing. <laughs> I'm gonna be a grand maester. I'm gonna be a badass husband and dad. And ain't nobody gonna stop me. <laughs> so power to the people. I am very excited for that little little power trio there and wishing them all the best that the world has to offer. Um, but we also get to return to Bravos and see how Arya's training as a, a faceless girl is coming. And once again, she, this is about her third time in attendance at the at the play in in the village where this time she actually gets to see the death of Joffrey, which she herself did not get to witness. And so it's very pleasurable for her, for her to actually see this event, even though it is totally played up and, and dramatized and and all of that good jazz. But, you know, as she gets to kind of vicariously experience her um, her vengeance toward the Lannisters satisfied. I think that that going to this play actually plays a very integral part in her decision ultimately to bid the House of Black and White farewell um, and to to reject the many-faced god. And now, essentially, it's going to be one face or another that's going to make its way into the temple. <laughs> and uh, she's got Needle back in her possession. So, you know, it's like we, we get to see you over at House Tarly um, in Horn Hill. We see Sam make off with, with Heartsbane. And then we get to see Arya get Needle just where she had left it. So, you know what? Some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was it was really cool to kind of to see her progression and as she actually gets the opportunity to connect with with Lady Crane, another woman who has given herself to a life of performances and putting on faces and she pays Arya some pretty fine compliments, you know, talking about the, the fire and expression in her eyes and her lovely eyebrows, which I mean, if she saw Amelia Clark, if she saw the Queen of Dragons, she'd be a <laughs> have a little competition in the room. But um, anyway, so so as Arya finds herself forging a connection with this woman, um, she she no longer feels feels the desire to commit to this life of, of senseless killing because that is essentially what it would be to her, um, carrying out these assassinations that mean nothing to her because fundamentally, like her her values are still so deeply embedded within her that even even a bout of blindness and living as a beggar was not enough to undermine her identity as Arya Stark. Which, I mean, I, I think we all knew <laughs> that that was the way that it was going to go. Um, but it's, it's super satisfying to see Arya finally claim her selfhood take back her identity, and unfortunately, that puts a major target on her back, and there's gonna be hell to pay from, um, I don't know, uh, what the title is of the girl who is currently going after her and who was spying on her backstage where she pinned the, uh, the murder tale on the donkey and, uh, <laughs> you know, put in her resignation notice, as it were. But yeah, there's gonna be, there's gonna be some some trouble but uh yeah she realizes that she gets to write her own story you know as she's talking with with lady crane who's um says like you know without without her her ideas her incentive the the writing is pretty much 
utter trash. And it's almost as if Arya decides to, you know, pick up the quill pen and write her own story. You know, she will be a girl with a face and a name and a name to her game. And I'm excited and terrified for her. Anything could happen at this point. But I feel like we wouldn't be invited to follow her on this journey if it wasn't for a greater purpose and perhaps to see her end up somewhere else besides, uh, you know, glug glug, <laughs> heading, heading down into the depths of death. I don't think that that's necessarily where she's headed. I don't know why, and now that I've said that, I've probably, you know, put the nail in the coffin. I apologize in advance. You can send me your therapy bills if, if certain things come to pass, but I feel like there's something else that's coming. I feel like we have been going on all of this craziness with her for a reason. I don't know. <laughs> call me crazy, call me crazy, but yeah, getting to see the story, the stories of King's Landing recounted and all these things that she has been very intimately connected with and then getting to to know this woman and see things from her perspective and see kind of forge sort of this kinship. Ultimately, Arya is able to reject this, this path that she was going down and uh, as to whether or not she's going to survive that rejection, we will see. Now, <laughs> speaking of King's Landing, there are some shenanigans afoot and none of them are particularly savory for houses Tyrell and Lannister. <laughs> Pretty much the two of them are both going down at this point uh, because the Crown and the Faith are getting down together officially because... So at first I thought that... Um, now, I think it's distinctly possible that Marjorie has a bigger endgame in mind and that she is going to try to play things to her favor or to the favor of House Tyrell. I'm not sure, but I that that scene with her and Loris to me was was very important where she tells him to stay strong and says that, you know, they they cannot win. And so I feel like she is on the outside conceding to the ways of the faith militant um, and is appearing to take on this religiosity, but it's possible that she could still spin it for her own purposes. She's, she's a smart woman, you know, and even all of the things that she says to Tommen behind closed doors that seems to be a gambit of her own as well. I really find it hard to take to take that at face value, to see her her surrendering to her incarceration and to those who have imprisoned her. And so with going on about how like, yes, I've done good things for the poor, but I was I was only doing it because I could be seen and because I could I could uh, curry the favor of, of the masses and, and bring everyone to my side. And so she goes on and on and says all of these things that make a lot of sense and that could potentially spell out a genuine transformation, but it can't be that simple. Can it? <laughs> Can faith be so, so all-encompassing and just spin you 180 degrees, no question? Mm, I am inclined to scratch my chin at that. I don't think it's that simple. Um, so, all things remain yet to be seen, but that that glorious announcement, you know, as we, um, as Jamie and the King's Guard are are met by um, by Toman and Marjorie and the High Sparrow all coming together. So in this joyous proclamation of, of unity and <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness, there, there's a war a coming in case you guys didn't know. Um, but I, I think that there are certain, certain machinations here and I think that Marjorie is, is working the system and she's, and she's trying to work the faith angle in order to get what she wants. Um, I don't think that she is just a puppet for Elena Tyrell, and 
I don't know, am I completely misreading the situation? What do you guys think? Um, because I, I would love to hear your theories, and I know that there are many of you who have some very in-depth ones, and it would be great if you could share them. I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, so that's what's going on there. And as a result of Jamie's defiance and the threat that he that he poses to the faith militant with with which Toman is now partnered, he issues a decree that Jamie be sent to deal with shenanigans at River Run because as a matter of fact, yes, the Blackfish is back in town. So in case any of you guys were doubting the veracity of uh, Peter Baelish's account and what he told Sansa, well, turns out there's some truth to the matter. And it's causing quite a bit of hullabaloo for um, the uh, partners of the Iron Throne. And, uh, and yeah, so we, and that is also confirmed by, uh, by Walder Frey and, um, yeah, all, all the, all the stuff going down at House Frey, we see like, okay, so House Tully is, is currently, um, not exactly under the throne's control. Um, and so Jamie is to be sent there to, to quell that situation. He is brimming over with rage, most understandably, but now Cersei is the one who's telling him, we wait. We will get our revenge when it is ripe and at its most delicious, and we will not bite into that fruit any sooner. So she, she is also trying to, to see things clearly amid the the confusion and, and the shock of the church-state uh, union, but yeah, more than meets the eye. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, goodness golly. Also, okay, so to follow up from, from last week and the cataclysmic loss of Hodor and death-defying escape of Bran and Mira, we get to see that Uncle Benjen is back in town and that he is ready to make sure that this little three-eyed raven in training is gonna be prepared to face the ultimate adversary. He gets him right on out of there, um, out of there being out of the clutches of the dead, and now it's time for them to set things in motion. So that is pretty freaking cool. Cool to see the return of a character who has pretty much been AWOL for seasons upon seasons, so we are back in the business there. Things, things are moving forward despite, despite the pain of the loss that is still so intense from last week. I continue to feel it. Um, but now, all of this takes me to our final moments with Daenerys as she raises the war cry and declares to the Dothraki, collectively her, um, her Kalasar, that she chooses all of them, not just three blood riders to be by her side. She, from atop the throne of her mighty dragon, declares that, that she, she will fight for them if they fight for her, and if they give her the seven kingdoms, if they plunge their daggers into, into the hearts of her enemies. And it is some seriously exciting stuff I have seen. No pep rally more exuberant. It's, it's exciting stuff. It's easy to see exactly why everybody is getting behind her. Um, and also bear in mind that as she is speaking to Dario, um, the tentative plan, or maybe, well, the plan, is to return to Marine and then head to Westeros, as it turns out. But in order to transport everybody, <laughs> all of her armed forces and ev everyone she's going to need, she's going to need a thousand ships. And you know who is currently building a thousand ships is her, uh, unbeknownst to her, uh, her upcoming suitor. Uh, <laughs> you guys remember a certain Euron Greyjoy because he's getting to making some ships that Daenerys could use. So, it does seem to, it does sound like the two of them are going to meet. And as to whether or not Daenerys is going to accept his hand or crush him under heel, 
we'll see how that situation goes down. But she is indeed a conqueror. Um, and it's and it's interesting that Dario says that because there have been times in the past where Daenerys says, you know, she is she is the liberator. And I believe that she still sees herself as such. But, you know, she's getting on to that wheel breaking business. You know what? She is she is conquering the system as we know it. So if I had to boil down this this episode into something nice and short and sweet, I would say that this episode is about people posturing themselves for preeminence. So posturing for preeminence. That is what this episode is about. Because, you know, we, we get that behind closed doors, we get that out in the opposite, uh, the opposite, the out in the open with the faith militant and, and the crown coming together. Um, and then elsewhere in the world with Daenerys raising the war cry and, um, and getting the, the commitment of, of the Dothraki people, um, as they rally to her cause. Um, yeah, and so so we see that all of these things are beginning to converge. All everybody is is beginning to march to battle, whether they are waiting for the moment to strike, and and um, strategizing as they build up to that point, or they are physically marching toward their their enemies slowly but surely. Um, so this makes this episode, I think, a very, a very important one, a very fascinating one, and I think we're going to see a lot of characters converging in interesting ways. If I'm not mistaken, Brienne is also heading towards River Run, so perhaps she and Jamie are going to see each other. I don't know. Um, but if there, if there is anything huge that I missed in this review, please feel free to address it in the comments below. And what did you guys think? Did you, did you enjoy this? Were you hoping for more? Was it satisfying, upsetting, lackluster, thrilling? I want to know all your thoughts. So, yeah, I definitely think some very important things happened this week. Didn't shed any tears necessarily, but oh, they're going to be coming. <laughs> so if you're in the same boat as me, be bracing your soul because we'll be in for more madness before we know it. So, yeah, I guess that leads me to the end. So you guys take care of yourselves, please. I have some new reviews. Stay tuned for those are coming very soon. And as always, I will be back before you know it.